Okay, uh, welcome to the uh, early attendees and hopefully more will be coming in. This is the second uh, webinar for uh, the party, Socialist Parties and the Prison Industrial Complex and the Abolish the Carceral State, a Socialist Party USA campaign for police and prison abolition and education. Um, my name is Greg Payson, National Secretary of the Socialist Party and facilitator of the conversation afterwards. Uh, our presenter today is um, James Quee from Montclair Beyond Policing and T-Boy Picnic, a community event for trans mass folks. Um, James actually introduced me to Montclair Beyond Policing in the early parts of the pandemic and really uh, inspired me to get more involved than I was. So I appreciate um, James for doing that. So this uh, presentation is going to be recorded. So for those who are not here today, you can see it on our YouTube channel. And then we'll have a short conversation afterwards with folks um, with your questions. And we'd like to try to get folks to focus on something in your community and how how do we build um, an alternative to the police state and how do we build our communities? So hopefully we can do that after this presentation. So James, it's all yours. All right, thanks, Greg. Um, so this is titled, a a subtitled a brief intro um as i was telling greg i don't actually know how long it's going to take but i'm going to try to zip through things um so we can get to at the end some examples of uh practices and um steps that people can take and bring home into their communities um and their organizations okay Right, so starting off with uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, um, who's a, a Marxist geographer and abolitionist and her description of abolition. Gilmore writes, abolition is a movement which is intended to change everything. Abolitionists of the current era started with prison, not because prison is alone the problem, but rather because it condenses all of the problems that radiate throughout our society. Right, so what is the prison industrial complex? Um, I'm going to give a, a definition um, penned by Critical Resistance, which is an abolitionist organization that began, I believe, in Oakland, California, um, and has offices in New York City as well. The prison industrial complex, or PIC, is a term we use to describe the overlapping interests of government and industry that use surveillance, policing, and imprisonment as solutions to economic, social, and political problems. Um, so the term prison industrial complex um, is often attributed to Angela Davis, um, but there is actually um, a citation that the historian uh, Dan Berger has brought up that's pretty interesting. So in 1974, the North Carolina Prisoners Labor Union called for an end to the judicial prison parole industrial complex because it places unrealistic and harsh prison sentences on persons largely from the poor classes while those with wealth go free. Um, so just, yeah, kind of interesting early moment of uh, abolitionist theorizing um, by incarcerated folks um, and incarcerated organizers. Okay, so I'm not going to read this whole block of text, um, just sort of uh, you know, going to track the basic movements. Um, so people may be familiar um, with Marx's concept of primitive accumulation, um, what he calls the prehistory of capital. Um, so the moment in or around starting the 15th century in Europe um, where we see colonization and the enclosure of the commons, right? So preventing uh, common people from living off the land. And from here, we move into a centuries long process of extra state and state violence um, and bloody legislation in Marx's words. Um, so a series of laws that establish this system of private property, right, where people are prohibited from living off the land. And this famously um, in Marx's theory, right, creates uh, the proletariat, right, a class of people who own nothing 
and therefore are wage dependent. Um, and this is kind of drawing on uh, uh, the work of Alex Vitali um, in The End of Policing. So he traces the movement from the system where people are forced to sell their labor to live um, within a highly unstable, inequitable, and crisis-prone capitalist system um, into the development of these institutions um, of violence work, right? Prisons and policing. Um, so in the US, you know, Texas Rangers, uh, fugitive slave patrols, Pinkertons, that essentially emerge to discipline, control, and contain um, these criminalized classes of people, right? Who are um, perceived by the state to be either threats or drains on the system. Um, in the law professor Dean Spade's words. Right? So in short, the prison industrial complex promises social order in the absence of social welfare. All right, so that is kind of a, an overview of the repressive function of the prison industrial complex. Um, so moving closer to the present moment, um, we're gonna look at Again, Will, Ruth Wilson Gilmore's theory um, of the prison fix, right? Kind of playing on David Harvey's uh, notion of the spatial fix. Um, and this is kind of Gilmore's theory of why, um, from the perspective of capital, um, prisons and policing have a productive purpose, right? A productive use um, for capital. So, Gilmore writes, and this is in her, um, uh, her, actually I can't remember if it's from the book or it's a, from an interview about the book, um, Golden Gulag, which is about the rise of uh, the prison industrial complex in California specifically. Um, so she says, I set myself the task of understanding what had happened in California between say the mid 1970s, um, the era of globalization, when anything could have emerged as a solution to surplus labor. And what actually happened starting in the early 80s in which California started to build prison after prison after, pr after prison, when it could have built universities or factories or veterans housing or parks or museums or anything else. So prisons then in my view, concentrate surpluses. The state of California used prison expansion provisionally to fix crises of land, labor, finance capital, and state capacity. Um, so essentially this is kind of a, an important thing to keep in mind, partly because I think when people say prison industrial complex, there is often a, a conflation um, of a critique of capitalism um, and a critique of um, simply corporatism, right? People think prison industrial complex, oh, that means uh, we have to get rid of private prisons or the problem is um, you know, corporate profit from prison labor, um, from these private facilities. Um, and actually private prisons make up um, a fairly small percentage of uh, prisons and jails in the US. Um, so the critique is of a system that takes a problem of surpluses, right? Labor that has to be mobilized towards something, uh, capital that has to be invested in something and takes as its object uh, prisons, right? Prisons and policing. Um, so essentially build up the institutions of violence work as opposed to anything else, um, life-giving institutions um, in Gilmore's words. Um, so kind of turning to the other side of the coin, as prisons and policing get offered as a, a kind of panacea for all the social problems that are endemic to racial capitalism and colonialism, PIC abolition on the other side is a broad liberatory framework um, and a kind of orientation for social movements that understand themselves to be antagonistic to capitalism. 
Um, so all of these um, intersecting movements and frameworks can have and often do have an abolitionist understanding. So that's one of the things that um, I and you know Montclair Beyond Policing um, has tried to kind of push into awareness, right? This idea that your movement can have an abolitionist framework um, and possibly it could not, right? There are ways that um, social movements can find themselves aligned um, with policing and the prison industrial complex um, if a kind of uh, abolitionist understanding isn't there. Right. So I want to I want to take a look at um, a couple of examples um, of how social movements can develop and commit to an understanding um, of how state investment in violence work produces harms across categories of identity. Um, so this is a. Uh, this is a oh, my looking yeah so this is taken from um, a news item about actually the great march of return of uh, 2018 and 2019 um, when Palestinian protesters um, peacefully protested um, for the Palestinian right of return um, and were met with um, massive violence. Um, including mass disabling violence that was very well documented. Um, so I want to highlight here a, a certain distinction between uh, a civil rights framework of disability and a disability justice framework. So disability rights um, as a movement has obviously produced incredibly important legal protections for disabled people um, that make it possible for a lot of people to take part in public life. Um, but as a, a, an orientation, it might also mean um, having a municipal disability commission that liaises with the police. Um, if there isn't an understanding of the racialized ways that disabled people um, can be inequitably targeted um, by policing. So disability justice, um, which is a movement that emerged in the 1990s, is, expli is explicitly abolitionist and is committed to solidarity between possibly relatively privileged disabled people and racialized working class disabled people and people in the global south who are likelier to experience impacts from policing, incarceration, colonial and imperialist, viol imperialist violence, um, like the generations of Palestinian protesters that the IDF aims to maim or blind. Um, so the mass disabling outcomes of war and settler colonialism are an abolitionist concern. Um, this is a, an excerpt from a very recent article um, about the ongoing bombardments um, and genocide in Gaza. Um, and you know, we probably are all familiar um, with sort of the, the horrible numbers around uh, the US military's carbon emissions, um, one of the most massive polluters on the planet. Um, and this article about the ecocide that Israel is committing um, alongside and in tandem with uh, the genocide that it's committing um, really highlights that environmental activism has to have an anti-imperialist framework as well um, and has to think about the way that uh, violence work like war, um, like settler colonialism is part of um, what is making the planet uninhabitable for, for many people. Um, okay, so I want to play a clip and I'm gonna see if I can maybe switch over to another tab. Um, so this is, uh, what you're looking at now is 
a picture of a recent book by the historian Hugh Ryan about the Women's House of Detention. Um, and I want to play you a clip from an interview where he talks a little bit about um, the the first night of the Stonewall Uprising. And Stonewall Inn was actually uh, about a block down from where the Women's House of Detention used to be. Um, so it's a pretty remarkable piece of history. That Stonewall isn't important, but I think that we talk so much about it. Set us up for another Zoom panel at 7 p.m. Uh, in the middle of Pride Month. You are uh, truly heroes. I'm actually really glad you asked this question because most years I spend pride complaining that we talk too much about Stonewall. Uh, not that Stonewall isn't important, but I think that we talk so much about it and not just Stonewall, but specifically that other amazing moments of queer militancy and intersectional activism both in the village at that time and around the country kind of gets obliterated you know we never talk about the haven riot that came six months later we never talk about the riot on international women's day in 1970 in greenwich village you know these were other violent clashes between the cops between queer people uh the black panthers the young lords uh many of the street people in the village radical lesbians all of this kind of gets forgotten but i will say there is one part of the Stonewall riots and particularly that first night of the Stonewall riot that I do want to talk about because I think that we don't talk about this enough, which is what was happening a block and a half away from Stonewall at the Women's House of Detention. For those of you who don't know, the Women's House of Detention was an 11 story women's prison that sat at the end of Christopher Street, where today the Jefferson Market Library is, that, that little garden there, that used to be an 11 story women's prison. It was built in 1932 and it was torn down in 1974. And on the night of the Stonewall riot, the first night, the women in the prison could see what was happening down the street. They knew what was going on. And you know, we talk about how brave the folks at the Stonewall uprising were, and they were, absolutely. But these women were imprisoned. They had nowhere to go. They had no freedom. They had no one to protect them from the guards. And they rioted in solidarity with the people on the outside. In fact, we have records from women who saw them screaming gay power, gay power, setting fire to their meager belongings and throwing them out the windows. Uh, and yet this never gets talked about when we talk about Stonewall. I actually want to read you, this is a, a little excerpt from Rita Mae Brown, who was at Stonewall on that first, or outside of Stonewall on that first night. And she wrote, I was in my early 20s. It was a very hot night. And Martha Shelley and I were walking through Sheridan Square in New York City. The cops, in a matter of seconds, pulled in front of this little bar. We all knew it was a men's bar. And we heard this noise. And the next thing we saw were cops flying out of the bar and patrons came flying out of the bar and they were running in their high heels and we realized, oh my God, it's faggots in revolt. This is heaven. And at the women's house of detention, the women heard the noise, noises and started rioting inside the prison. All the windows were up because it was summer and the women burned their mattresses and shoved them through the bars. And this never gets written up because all the accounts of that period were given by men. The folks who were in the prison that night, uh, and in fact, almost the entirety of the life of that prison, about 50% of the women and trans masculine people who were there, were there for sex work related charges. Uh, many, many, many of these people were queer. Many of them were political activists. Uh, and there's, before I, I let go, there's just one other thing about the night, that first night that I want to mention. One of the women who was in prison that night was one of the leaders of the Black Panther Party named Afini Shakur. Uh, she was not only a political activist, she's a writer, she's the mother of the musician Tupac Shakur, and she actually talked about being in the prison during the Stonewall riots, during other actions by the Gay Liberation Front and the Radical Lesbians, and after she got out, she went to the Black Panther Party's Revolutionary People's Convention in Philadelphia in 1970, and she met with the Gay Liberation Front, and the Gay Liberation Front wrote this up afterwards. Afini Shakur came to one of our workshops. She's one of the New York 21 Panthers now on trial for conspiracy to blow up the botanical gardens. She told us about how she looked out of her prison cell window during a demonstration to free the NY 21, seeing a gay liberation banner in the crowd made her think for the first time about gay people and gay liberation. She then began relating to the gay sisters in jail, beginning to understand their oppression, their anger, and the strength in them and in all gay people. 
She talks about how Huey Newton's statement would be used in the Panther Party, not as a party line, but as a basis for criticism and self-criticism to overcome anti-homosexual hangups among party members and in the black community. She helped us to formulate what we wanted to say in our list of demands. She worked with the Gay Liberation Front from the moment she got out of the prison. She worked with radical queer women. She worked with early trans journalists to try and connect the Black Panther Party and the emerging gay rights movement because she understood in a truly intersectional way how these movements were all connected and how they all flowed through and together at the Women's House of Detention. Uh, can you hear me again? Yes. <laughs> yes. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> clip. I remember seeing that the first time. I think you scared it on another, uh, was that another webinar? Like, oh, really? Yeah. It's just a fantastic um, uh, clip. Let, let me get my slides back up. Um, okay. So I want to hop from that to um, a couple of examples of practices and um, organizations that are doing um, solidarity work with incarcerated organizers. Um, as Hugh Ryan emphasized, right, a lot of, I mean, the prison is and has been a huge site of radical organizing um, and solidarity work. So Black and Pink, um, is an amazing organization. Um, I'll read you a, a little bit of their self-description. Um, we are a prison abolitionist organization dedicated to abolishing the criminal punishment system and liberating LGBTQIA two-spirit plus people and people living with HIV AIDS who are affected by that system through advocacy, support, and organizing. Um, so one of the major campaigns that they have ongoing um, is these letter writing campaigns um, and they, you know, hold these events monthly in New York. Um, there are a few actually that take place uh, near me. And I believe, I don't know if Montclair Beyond Policing has done a black and pink um, coordinated uh, letter writing, but yeah, we, we've done um, letter writings through, I think other organizations and then one-offs on our own. Um, so just a really great way to connect um, with people inside and extend sort of the, the reach um, of your organizing. Um, this is, so the next few slides are actually drawn from um, a workshop that Montclair Beyond Policing put together. Um, and it's a workshop based on a model that was developed by Mia Mingus, is pictured here, um, of the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective. And it's called pod mapping. Um, so we have just a, a couple of um, a couple of slides drawn from that workshop just to give you sort of a taste of it. Um, and then I believe Greg, we had talked about like maybe opening up, like making that um, available if people are interested in, uh, in looking more into a pod mapping workshop. Yes, yes. Um, so an abolitionist understanding of harm um, is opposed to a carceral understanding um, of harm and crime, right, would be the, the framework that uh, the carceral state would use. So abolitionists understand that harm creates needs. How can we respond to these needs in ways that don't reproduce harms, don't create more cycles of harm and violence, um, but are transformative, right? Transform the situation in which the harm took place um, and what made that harm possible. So pod mapping offers community accountability, safety, healing, um, those things that abolitionists believe need to be brought to bear on instances of harm and violence um, without policing or carceral institutions. The focus is relationship building and strengthening connections within communities. Um, and this is based on the understanding that isolation um, compounds harm. Isolation intensifies uh, the harm that can happen. 
So, Mia Mingus writes, your pod is made up of the people that you would call on if violence, harm, or abuse happened to you, or the people that you would call on if you wanted support in taking accountability for violence, harm, or abuse that you've done, or if you witnessed violence or if someone you care about was being violent or being abused. Um, so, in those situations where we kind of, you know, are oftentimes socialized to think there's nothing I can do, you know, this isn't my responsibility or simply I'm not equipped to address this. Um, who do we call, right? Pick up the phone and call the cops. Um, Mia Mingus and the BATJC have put together this module um, that prepares us and prepares our communities. Um, and she actually has a, a really interesting <laughs> sort of critique of the way we use the word community in this very vague way, uh, prepares the people in our lives um, to be organized and to get organized in case harm occurs um, or in case we need to hold ourselves accountable um, and repair relationships. So this is a, a handout, a worksheet that the BATJC uses to facilitate pod mapping. Um, and yeah, we did a few of these workshops. Um, and I think I would also say it, it's interesting um, how like you kind of see a, a workshop like this or a, a model like this um, formalizing um, community organizing or just neighborhood organizing, block organizing, um, that might happen in sort of more organic or more um, informal ways, um, the ways that people who are in proximity, right, just kind of, they find ways to, to take care of each other and to um, solidify their ability to rely on each other in times of crisis. Um, so pod mapping, I think, is a, just a really great way to say, okay, we don't necessarily all have those relationships of physical proximity. Um, you know, a lot of us, we live in a very atomized society, um, just don't have a lot of close relationships, period. Um, so just a really great um, way to reflect on the relationships in your lives, how to strengthen them um, and how to organize them. Um, and hopefully, that radiates outward into further anti-carceral, anti-policing practices um, in very, very small practical ways. Um, okay, so that is what I have. Um, and then I think, Greg, were you going to open it up for discussion?